Welcome to the Lockdown Lectures, where we're learning about the lives of some of Manchester's amazing researchers. Today we're joined by acclaimed historian, broadcaster and filmmaker, David Olashoga, OBE, Professor of Public History. David is one of the UK's foremost historians addressing issues on human history, including empire, race and slavery. These subjects feature prominently in his award-winning TV series and books. Born in Nigeria to a Nigerian father and British mother, David moved to the UK with his mother as a young child. Growing up on a council estate in Gateshead, his home was attacked by the National Front on multiple occasions and his family eventually forced to leave. He has since said that he got into history to make sense of the forces that affected his life. Welcome, David. So we're talking via video because of the lockdown at the moment. Um, so how are you coping with the lockdown? Has there been anything in particular that's getting you through? Maybe any compulsive reading or viewing? Uh, there's not. There should be. That I work in television. I should be watching a lot, a lot of television. I'm not. I'm trying to work. Um, I run. Um, one of my jobs is I run the company, and we have um, employees, and we have had to try to work out how we're going to see if we can survive this situation. So, like lots of people, I'm trying to work out how you create a pathway to a post-COVID-19 world. However, I I suspect um, that what we're probably looking at is a world where we have to live with COVID-19 rather than a world after and we're being a bit premature. So I've been doing that. I've been trying to keep working on TV projects that I'm doing. I've tried to keep writing. I've got a TV series which is being broadcast um, in a few weeks time. Um, so I'm looking forward to that and that means talking to lots of journalists. So I'm trying to pretend that life's normal when it isn't. Um, Denial is my normal way of treating difficult situations, very British. So I think I'd probably be doing that. And this next question is from Isabel Arnold on Instagram. And Isabel asks, do you think that we can learn any lessons from history about how we should tackle the pandemic and recover from it? Well, to take the second part of that question first, um, I think recovery is going to take decades. And I think we're used to the idea that the the crises that we face are short-term crises. They are they are wars that are one-sided where the West attacks another country and we're not at risk and it's over in a few months, or they're financial crises that maybe last a couple of years. We haven't faced something that is going to cast a shadow over decades to come, and I think that's exactly where we were. I think we're at where we are now. I think we're in a situation like the Great Depression and like the Second World War in some ways, combination of the two in uh, uh, to, to some ex extent. But we're not used to that idea that um, an event can absolutely change our lives and that the world that we knew, we're not going back to. And that's a really, really difficult idea for us to get our heads around. But anybody who was alive in 1939, they didn't return to the world of 1939 and 1945. They returned to a profoundly changed world. And I think without exaggerating and comparing where we are now because we don't know what, what's where this story will take us i think we, there are some comparisons with events like the second world war in the, the extent which it's going to change lives whether that's for the better or for the worse kind of it's hard to tell at this point and what do you think this crisis tells us about society in britain and globally as well well i think one of the things which has struck me um this society seems to have been and this crisis has had this amazing ability and this virus has this amazing ability to shine a spotlight into aspects of our culture that we knew were there, but we got very good at ignoring homelessness, um, the inequality of income between people doing what are now called front frontline jobs were until a few weeks ago called low skilled jobs. I think it's shown the um, the realities of racial inequality because although there is, is it seems a physiological dimension without doubt to why this virus affects people from certain population groups more than others, there is also a lot to do with um, people's uh, socioeconomic situation. So lots of things that we were aware of have been have really been brought out into the open, and that's quite quite good in some ways. It's um, it's reminded us of things that a lot of people have been talking about for a long time. For example, the fact that the story of immigration in this country and the story of the National Health Service are absolutely intertwined. They are twinned. The Windrush 
arrived in the same summer the NHS was born. And since its inception, it's been dependent on doctors and nurses from India, from the Caribbean, from Africa. The, these stories were absolutely part of the same phenomena, and yet they've become separated. We love the NHS. We are uncomfortable uh, about immigration. We want immigration controlled and reduced. So in lots of ways, some of these things, it's good that they're brought out into the open. The way it's happening is, of course, absolutely tragic and terrifying. One of the things that we're all adapting to during the pandemic is being away from the workplace. Um, so what would you say that you miss the most about the University of Manchester at the moment? Well, the irony for me is that I had to finish very quickly the last chapters of a short book that I'd written to go with a TV series I make called A House Through Time. So I spent the first three weeks of this year, from the 1st of January, um, not leaving the house and writing 15 hours a day. Uh, that now seems like an incredibly stupid idea um, to have voluntarily, without any compulsion or any crisis, um, put myself in that situation. And I bitterly regret doing that. But in that process, a lot of what I was writing about was about the housing of the working class in the 19th century. And I was reading the accounts of people like Edwin Chadwick and um, Dr. Um, James Kay, uh, and also Elizabeth Gaskell and, uh, and Frederick Engels. And what they're writing about is Manchester. Um, and so... I was very much looking forward, not just to being back at the university, I was looking forward to taking an evening off and having a walk around, particularly the area north of, um, of Piccadilly, the area around there, where so much of the Victorian streetscape has survived. I was sort of looking forward to doing my sort of urban history. Uh, I did a degree in urban history, and it's, a, it's still a big passion of having one of those tours where I walk around and uh, try to transport myself back to the uh, to the 19th century and look at those mills and imagine them as places of work rather than as you know what they are now, which is accommodation and apartments. So um, I was very much looking forward to my uh, my, my first day back in Manchester um, for, for for those reasons. I didn't dream when I was writing those chapters that um, I wouldn't know when I'd go back to Manchester. It's a very strange thought. And looking back, David, you've had a successful career. Um, but what advice would you have given to yourself looking back at the start of this career? Well, I, I, I think my careers have a lot to do with luck. And I think we live in a society where people um, attribute any success they have to their own abilities. It's called self-attribution fallacy. So I'm very, very careful to not write out of the, the career that I've had um, a degree of luck. But I think the thing which I, I, I wish I'd worked out earlier was that um, it's about longevity. It's about staying at something, that you become part of a, um, a subculture if you stay within a profession and that you pick up lots of things and it's about staying within it. But there's also, um, the, with me in history, the, the, the big thing has been something which I worked out along the way and it would have been good if I'd known it to begin with, which is that if you love one subject, if you're passionate about one subject, you have to be able to engage with that subject in multiple ways. And so um, by accident, I found myself writing books as well as making TV programs, as well as making radio programs, as well as presenting, as well as writing the newspapers. That actually was the strategy I should have had from the outset. If you are monomaniacal and all you want to do is history, you you have to be able to do history in lots of different ways and lots of different arenas. So I sort of, I worked out rather than uh, had a moment of inspiration at the beginning. So I would go back and tell myself what I've learned the hard way. I think that's great advice. Um, and on the subject of the current situation, what advice would you have given to yourself at the start of lockdown? Well, I was, um, I was actually quite convinced this was going to happen from the end of January. So, uh, um, I'm a, I don't see myself as a pessimist, but I do see myself as somebody who is um, sceptical. Uh, and I was, um, I struggled to see why this condition would not transmit itself to Europe. And I struggled to see why what had happened in China wouldn't happen here. So I was sort of quite prepared. I went into what we've subsequently called lockdown weeks before the government um, told us to. I don't think we're going to have a... A world of COVID and a world of after COVID. We're going to have a world with with COVID, and um, we'll all be making choices. And some is going into lockdown is the easy thing, and it was the thing governments could do. The coming out is going to be personal choices. We see this already today with people choosing, often forced into that choice by economics, whether they're going to go back 
to work or not. And I think, I suspect, and I fear most of us will have to make that decision and weigh up the risks, weigh up our own health, um, our health backgrounds um, and the risk factors. And that's that's a really, really difficult decision. And I feel I've been blessed in my life because I haven't had to make very many difficult decisions. And I read all the time about people um, and the pages of historical documents who are forced into absolutely appalling situations. And what you do as a, a writer of history and a reader of history is you wonder, well, what would I do in that situation? Well, I think we are out. Many of us are now going to face a very big choice. Um, and, and maybe our lives haven't trained us very well for that sort of situation. But our ancestors knew how to do it. And I guess we learn. Amy, thank you so much for taking the time to answer those questions. We'll now pass over to you for your lecture.